developing a healthy self-knowledge, a good, in other words, a good self-awareness. Um, someone said, yourself, the hardest person you'll ever have to lead. Because <laughs> no one else can do this work of self-awareness but us. We've each got to do it for ourselves, haven't we? So very practically, we need to study ourselves, understand our temperament, our inclinations, our, our vulnerabilities, recognizing that most problems are in here rather than out there. So, you know, if things or when things start to go wrong or start to unravel, we, we need to get into the habit of taking a look at ourselves first. And an e the easiest way to do that is to ask ourselves questions. Get into the habit of questioning, you know, our motives, our, our attitudes, our feelings. What's going on here? You know, not in an unhealthy, sort of self-absorbed kind of way, but in a robust and inquisitive, searching way. Um, even as we walk out of the front door, you know, of our front doors in the morning. You know, just ask ourselves something like this. What do I need to purge out of myself today so I don't splurge on everyone else? You know, in other words, are there things uh, that we purposely, purposefully need to leave behind at that moment? Maybe all sorts of things, maybe an unresolved sort of issue with someone close to us or um, a, a worry over our finances or a niggling, niggling fear about our health. Could be all sorts of things. Uh, but I'm sure we've all been in that situation, whether it's at work or even in a church meeting or with a group of friends, when someone just explodes out of nowhere, you know, splurging their stuff over everyone around them. And you know it's nothing to do with what's going on there. It's something they've brought with them. I mean, just think of the places you move to, to and from during a day, during a normal day. What do you need to leave behind as you move from one situation to another? And if we don't leave things behind, what emotion might we find ourselves projecting or transferring from one set of relationships, whether it's at work or in family or social, onto another? You know, when we're leaving work to make our way home or leaving home to go to a church meeting or a friend's home, do we realize how much who I am in one situation affects who I am in another? Do we engage with self? Are we regularly sending ourselves sort of little mental notes that question our, our reactions or responses to people and situations around us? Um, I heard someone say the other day that we need, ought to get into the habit get used to having a, a sort of three-way conversation going on at the same time. That sounds ridiculous, sounds impossible, doesn't it? But actually, he's, they're right. We're having a conversation with someone in front of us, that's obvious. But we're also, I believe, as Christians, as believers, having a conversation with God, you know, listening to that inner voice of the Spirit, aren't we? Engaging with him, asking, you know, maybe for wisdom or for courage or for discernment. And, you know, many of us are quite good at those two conversations. But the third conversation is the one that we can easily leave out, can easily neglect, a conversation with ourselves. Uh, so, for example, you're in a room with a group of people, and as, it, as the dis discussion is going on, you're making notes to self, engaging with self, asking yourself things like, why did I feel threatened by that contribution? Or why am I suddenly getting defensive? Or why am I feeling that person doesn't like me <laughs> or doesn't value me? Or why have I overreacted? Why have I reacted so strongly to that particular comment? Do you see, it's the conversation with ourselves, checking in with self, making a note to self. Someone called it exploring the iceberg. In other words, trying to work out what's going on under the surface in that vast area of our feelings and responses, our insecurities, our temptations that vast hidden area of our lives. And at the end of each day, you know, it's worth taking a moment before we go off to sleep, just very simply, not making a big thing of it, just to look back, um, ask ourselves, what's been going on inside of me today? Um, I was uh, uh, encouraged to use the little phrase, mad, bad, sad or glad, which we often use as a family around uh, 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 the meal table. Just throwing it out, four simple questions that you can use as you look back on the day. Um, I'm sorry, it's written slightly wrong in your notes. I'm not quite sure why, but it's the first one. What am I mad about? What stirred me up? What's, what's made me angry even today? 
And the second one should be when it says, what, uh, what am I anxious about? Should be, what am I feeling bad about? What's been left unresolved maybe? Then what am I sad about? What's upset me? What's distressed me today? What am I glad about? What's been good? What's been productive? What's been fulfilling? Just use those simple questions going around in your mind and then turn them into prayer. Turn, hand them over to God. In fact, why don't we just pick one of those things for ourselves right now, just for a minute or two. Just pick any of those questions and just think back over the last day or two and ask yourself that question. You know, what am I mad about or bad about, feeling bad about or sad about or glad about? Just pick one. Just take a moment to think about it. Just to think over what that situation, that person, that feeling. Now in your mind, just in your time, just turn it over to God. Just turn it over to him. Say, yeah, you know that's been bothering me. Or you know that's how I felt. Or you know that's why it made me, that made me angry, made me upset. Just turn it over to him. you see such a simple thing but it just makes us more aware doesn't it makes us more aware of what's been going on inside of us makes us more aware of God too and his part where he is in all of it so if that's helpful take that away and use that and then number two watch your thought life because we need to remember don't we that we're in a spiritual battle we have an enemy who is out to rob us of our sense of worth and identity and security and one of the most successful ways he does that is to is he messes with our minds. I don't know if you've heard of that little phrase, he messes with our minds. He's a master at this. And one of the clever mind tricks that he uses is to, to get us to repeat his thoughts. And have you noticed that he never, we never seem to be reminded, need to be reminded of anything negative. You know, I'm not good enough or I'm, I don't match up or I, I'll never succeed. Those negative thoughts. These are very familiar phrases to many of us. We hear those things again and again going round in our minds. And the problem is when we repeat those things to ourselves, we start to believe them. Satan plays with our minds. Now I wonder, do you recognize how he plays you personally? What strategies he uses? What maybe easy footholds he gains? Do you know how he works you? Do you know where you're vulnerable? how he plays on your, your personal doubts and fears, your particular insecurities and temptations. What's the talk going on in your head? The different voices you listen to, it may be the fearful voice, it may be the hopeless voice, it may be the condemning voice, maybe the condoning voice or, or the doubting voice, all sorts of voices. How is the enemy messing with your mind? Because the stories we believe about ourselves will, will, inform, um, uh, will inform who we are, we're becoming and the choices we're making each day. These stories, of course, have the power to define us, to propel us or to undermine us. And the truth is we can waste so much of our lives living under negative scripts. You know, I'm too ordinary or I'm too stupid or I'm too ugly or I'm, too, I'm just unlovable. And we need to ask ourselves, what stories have we allowed in that have replaced the better story? The story of God's love and rescue over our lives. Because the enemy will always reinforce the negative, the negative narrative. And we need to learn how to silence him. And you know, we can do this in a number of very practical ways. Firstly, through the power of daily decisions, small, important, daily decisions that refuse to collude with the enemy's narrative. 
uh, one woman said to me when I gave this talk last, she said, uh, yeah, she said, I realized that um, I'd uh, uh, started using the scales. I was weighing myself every day. And when I weighed a little bit less, I felt good. And when I weighed a little bit more, I felt bad. She said, I realized it was just the, ne the, the enemy's negative narrative over my life. This is what you are because this is what you look like and this is what you weigh. She said, I put those scales in the cupboard and I said, I'm not going to get them out. I'm going get, to get them out once a week. Little thing, small daily decisions. Then through the power of naming the narrative, you know, when things are kept secret, the enemy has oxygen to fuel the fire, doesn't he? Name the narrative, name that thing, name that habit or that belief that, that, that holds you captive. You'll find it suddenly loses its power, some of its power. Then through the power of going back to, looking, to look forward. Sometimes we need to go back to help us understand the underlying narratives in our lives that have shaped our thinking. And I'm going to look a little bit more at that uh, just a little bit later. Then the power of community, keeping close to others. We need each other. We can't do this stuff alone. And that's why a day like this is so valuable. Building friendships, maintaining friendships. And then through the power of, of, of aligning ourselves to the better story. The better story. And God, you know, is powerful. We know this, don't we? He's powerful enough to break down and to, to break down even the deepest narrative over our lives and write his better story. And I love the little phrase in Psalm 107, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. We have a story to tell because God's story has been written and is being written over each of our lives. The story of how he's rescued us and redeemed us and, and freed us. So will we allow, will we cooperate with him rather than with the other one, with the enemy? cooperate with God, where we allow God's better story, the best story of all, to shape us. I wonder what words you would use to describe yourself. Ken, just for a moment, just close your eyes and just think what words you might use, you would use to describe yourself. Just words. What words would you use to describe yourself? And now just staying with your eyes closed, just ask God what words he would use to describe you. Oh, Jesus, what words would you, you use to describe me? Ask him to affirm your identity, to speak words to you. Imagine what he might say to you. Ask him for a word or two. Now, I understand and I recognize that for some of you, that might have been quite difficult, it might have been quite hard. But then just ask yourself, what, what is the enemy feeding and has been feeding into my mind? What has he been telling me that I need to recognize? I need to recognize that voice, but more than anything, I need to recognize God's voice. So take that away with you. And you may want to write down if you heard, if you felt you heard God saying a word or two to you, then write it down. Don't lose it. Take it away. Let it feed your spirit, feed your soul. Then number three, understanding our personality. Working with it, not against it. Not comparing or competing with others. Learning what energizes us and what drains us personally. Uh, what times of day, what situations, what people, what tasks even affect us negatively or positively. Ask yourself, have you allowed your life to be filled up with a lot of things maybe that affect you negatively rather than positively? Or people who drain you rather than energize you? I mean, just think about the kind of things that drain you and the sort of things that energize you. 
maybe just turn to your neighbor turn on you're not sitting next to anyone just turn to someone behind you turn to them and and just maybe share one thing you've loved doing over this past week and one activity is so in other words one activity that filled you up and one thing that very clearly drained you and then try to explain why you know why those two things were at polar opposites one thing that filled you up one thing that drained you okay just uh turn in twos don't don't go in big groups because you won't have time to share just uh one on one Okay, I'm going to draw us back together again. I know you probably could keep on going for a long time more. <laughs> but um, our aim should be as far as it's within our power to just put in the diary a sufficient number of things that will energize us to keep, you know, our emotional, our physical, our intellectual, relational batteries topped up. You know, and I, I do believe that sometimes we women are a martyr to nothing. You know, we, we often put ourselves, you know, we, we put ourselves at the end of the list, at the bottom of the pile, you know, and everyone else and everything else comes first. But actually, we're not much good to other people if we're not 
really in, you know, in, enjoying and fulfilling, feeling fulfilled and, uh, uh, and keeping healthy. And of course, the kind of experiences and activities that drain us and energize us will differ, differ from personality to personality, whether we're more, more extrovert or introvert, whether we're sporty or artistic, whether we're more of a thinker or a feeler. You know, it's, it's important, isn't it? Really important to understand what makes us tick. Otherwise, we'll find ourselves filling our lives with the things that sap our energy and drain our spirits rather than fill us up and refresh us. So what fills us up and what drains us? And just think to yourself, maybe just take this away to think about what fresh resolve do I need to make in the light of that? Ladies talking. What do I need to find time for to address the balance? May only be just a little thing that will just give you that sense of yes. This is where it fits. This is what feels good. You're allowed. I give you permission. Then setting a sustainable pace. Um, at a leadership conference re recently, I picked up, well, actually it wasn't so recently, it was years ago. <laughs> I picked up a phrase which was, very, which was new to me and not part of my experience. Um, we were simply told to lead out of rest. Lead out of rest. Genesis 1 tells us that evening and morning was the first day. Are we working out of God's natural order? You see, activity was created by God to come out of rest. Our day begins, in effect, when we go to sleep. Our activity is birthed out of rest. Now, do we view it like that, or are we always trying to catch up on the wrong side of the clock? Are we leading out of rest or leading out of endless activity? You know, when we constantly burn the candle at both ends and foolishly think that we can get away with it, when, you know, late nights followed by early mornings, followed by later nights, followed by early, and we become endemic to our pattern of life. You know, we show a lack of wisdom at how God created us. See, alongside our need for good sleeping patterns is a need for good working patterns. You know, that six-day, one-day pattern of work is hardwired into creation and therefore into every human being. And behind the Sabbath commandment lies a creation pattern which many of us act as though we can ignore. Sunday isn't the last day in the week, it's the first. One senior doctor wrote this, we doctors in the treatment of nervous diseases are compelled to provide periods of rest. Some of those periods are, I think, only Sundays in arrears. See, setting a sustainable pace. It's so important, isn't it? So can I ask you, have you established healthy patterns of rest and relaxation, of work, and sleep? If not, what needs to change? What can we change? What's in our power to change? Again, it need, it need only be sometimes just a, a, a little, a little thing. Often we can't do more, but even a little change can make a difference. Setting a sustainable pace. Then number five, recognizing our drivers. What is the driving force in your life? Uh, right now, you may be driven by a, a problem or a pressure or a deadline. You may be driven by a painful memory or a persistent fear or an unconscious belief. There are many different circumstances, many different values and emotions that can drive our lives. But here are just five common drivers that can control what we do and what we value. Number one, the drive to be perfect. So, so, so success and achievement are, are important to, to us, those of us who are perfectionists. And if you're a perfectionist, you like to be in control of things. You probably don't like taking risks. The drive to be perfect. The drive to please others. So we're constantly looking for approval and affirmation. We're controlled by the opinion of others, which can quite honestly end up exhausting. Uh, the drive for efficiency. So we have high standards for ourselves and for those around us. And that can make us hard taskmasters, difficult to live with, for our husbands maybe, or our children, or our work colleagues, our flatmates. Then the drive to be strong. So appearance is all important. We don't like showing signs of weakness. And so often we put up a front, a mask. We don't easily let people in. 
the drive to be strong, and then the drive to be hard, to try harder. So we're very determined. We're always pushing for more, but we often don't know when to stop. When can we say enough is enough? The drive to try harder. Now, I wonder what you see of yourself in those five drivers, maybe a little bit of each, <laughs> but probably one will stand out more than the others. And, you know, the important thing to note is that none of these are totally wrong in themselves. You know, it's good to want to please others. It's good to be, it's healthy to be determined. It's important to have goals. These are all good things. They only become a problem when they develop into drivers, when they become the things that actually control the direction and the speed of our lives. And, you know, these drivers are often rooted in experiences from our past. And it's, you know, it's a rare person who escapes the early years of life without accumulating some baggage. But if our lives are driven by stuff in the past rather than governed by the call of God on our lives in the present, we'll never find peace or satisfaction or joy. These drivers will drive us. Uh, you know, a number of years ago, I realized that I had an increasing problem with guilt, a fear of letting people down, of disappointing them. Um, and I realized that much of my motive for ministry was out of guilt, trying to please everyone and never feeling that I'd done enough. And my recurring bad dream over that time was that I'd wake up and I'd, I had an awful feeling that I'd upset someone and I didn't know who it was or what I'd done. You know, guilt had become my driver. And it became quite exhausting, you know, especially as a vicar's wife, which was what I am, with all the possibilities of all the people I could have upset. You know? <laughs> and I had to start asking myself, what was going on? I have to ask God, what was going on here? Where was this all coming from? And he gave me some insights as to where all this began. Uh, you see, my parents went through years of unhappiness from when I was quite young, right through my teenage years. And my response had been to, first of all, try and be the good girl, to try and make things okay, to keep the peace, and then to be the mediator, to try, and, to try and make peace, help them make peace. And neither had worked. And they finally divorced, and a year later, my father died, uh, very suddenly, very tragically, in a car crash. And I was left, I think, with the terrible feeling that I should have done more. I should have, I should have been able to help them. I, I let them down. You know, irrational, but real. And those strong fears and insecurities can stay with us, can't they? They're not dealt with, and they will prove to be an easy, easy landing stage for the enemy. And I have to tell you, you know, I'm, so, I'm not someone who readily takes time out to do this work of introspection. Uh, I'm, I'm a doer. Um, that, that's why actually it's quite funny that I'm doing a seminar like this, you know, I'm, I'm, this doesn't come naturally to me. I'm a doer, I do everything fast, you know, whether it's walking or shopping or cleaning or cooking, you know, or exercising, you know, I'm a nightmare in a Pilates class, you know, it, it, it's, it, it, but more seriously, I have always been an expert at just pushing issues away, thinking that if I ignore them, you know, long enough, they'll just go away. But the problem is if we never deal with the hurts and trauma of our lives, then we set ourselves up on a vicious cycle of unlearned lessons, um, unsolved issues, and unresolved grief. We've got to be brave enough and persistent enough sometimes to uncover, to, to unravel those deeper emotions and attitudes that form our character and shape our lives. And sometimes we have to look back in order to move forward, that same phrase again, taking time to dig out the roots. So I wonder, what is it for you? Is there something maybe that's been sticking to you, staying with you from the past, some unhealthy driver, something that you need to admit to yourself and to ask God to release you, to free you from it, even today? Again, I'd like you just to turn to your neighbor with people you're talking with, and share if any of those drivers, any, any of those drivers have begun to control the way you do things. Do you recognize yourself in any of those? Do you recognize that they've maybe been beginning to control the speed and direction of your life? Okay, again, I'll give you a few minutes.
Again, I'm going to just ask you to come back to the middle towards me. I know this is a big one, and I found this one fascinating. Um, and it's worth just staying with and uh, continuing conversations. But just to pick up and keep going on that theme of, of, of looking back to move forward, this next one, learning from the past. Again, I've just put down, really, I want you to take this away and use this as a little exercise um, when you're at home. But learning from the past, because, you know, we'd all recognize, we've all been shaped by experiences in life, whether they've been good ones or bad ones. But do we recognize the impact these different experience have had, experiences have had on us? So I would just encourage you to, is to say, take this exercise away and, and say, you know, answer them, look at them, write things down, maybe journal on them. What have you personally learned from some of these different experiences in your life? Whether it's been through your family or your education or your work or your prayer life or ministry or relationships or suffering and that probably that last one suffering whether it's you know been through pain or loss or sickness or failure frustration disappointment delay you know whatever it's been that may be one of the most key ones of all of course because the problems we face in life will either defeat us or they will develop us they will either draw us closer to god or we will push, or, we'll, or we'll push away and depending on how we respond to them will be how you know it will depend so much on just that last one on how we face the really tough things so can i encourage you just to take that away with you take your time over it just uh, and i i i just found some things quite surprising that jumped out the page at me when i just looked at that what have i experienced what has stayed with me and particularly if you just think to yourself okay what what simply you know don't don't think too hard just think okay what's when i think of family my family growing up, what, what, what do I think about? What do I feel? You know, what does that mean to me? When I think of my education, you know, maybe there were disappointments. Maybe they, they, you, know, you wish you, you know, could have done this rather than that. Maybe there's the other things that have surprised you, how God has linked things up together. So take that away and look at that. And then number seven, this is a tough one as well, but I know that many people through this, particularly through this last 18 months have um experience the sense of just going down and down and down um and whether it's in your emotions or exhaustion or uh, just that that sense of just the endlessness of uh, this pandemic um this has been an important one and when things feel like they're getting out of control there's a question i found really useful to ask is this just an episode or has it become a lifestyle and i believe you know it's the same for that that question for the pandemic actually will we make this what's happened to us this last 18 months will we allow it to just hang over us you know for years and years to come or will we see this is an episode or has it become a lifestyle because we can sustain high pressure for a short while but we need to ask serious questions if actually it goes on for too long and i wonder what are the signs for you personally that you've not paced yourself right that you're maybe running too fast could be all sorts of things, could be sleeplessness, could be digestive problems, or headaches or anxiety attacks, could be short temper, could be withdrawal, shutdown, different ways in which we find ourselves responding. And it's important to recognize the different levels of anxiety, different levels of pressure, a bit like the, the warning lights on the car of a dashboard, the, the car dashboard. You know that my husband tells me i take absolutely no notice of whatsoever but you know for example the fuel lights that we've all been watching avidly this last <laughs> this last week but we need to watch out you know don't we when the gauge is getting dangerously low when the lights start flashing <laughs> and then they stay full on <laughs> we really know we're in trouble then or like traffic lights you know are we on green or amber or has it moved to red and here are just eight amber stroke red warning warning signs that might tell us if we're getting near the edge. Number one, you feel like your main emotion is numbness. You know, if you're healthy, you feel things, you experience highs and lows. When you're burning out, when you're getting near the edge, you can't feel anything properly anymore. You feel numb. Now, this could be one of the earliest signs uh, of, of burnout. Number two, become cynical. You know, cynicism never 
finds a home in a healthy heart. If you find your cynicism is advancing at a rapid rate, it may be a warning sign. Number three, little things make you angry. You know, when you're overstretched, little things can become disproportionately important. You know, something like a missed deadline, which should be, you know, just a sort of four out of 10 on the problem scale, you react like it was an 11. That's never good. Treating small things like they're big things is a sign something, something's going wrong under the surface. Number four, nothing satisfies. When you're living with too much pressure, nothing seems to satisfy or re-energize anymore. Even the people closest to you who used to be maybe your source of enjoyment and strength often feel like a, a drain on your emotions. Or the tasks that used to excite you, they just don't anymore. When nobody or nothing energizes you, I would dare to say they're not the problem, you are. We need to look at it. Your productivity drops. Uh, one sign of burnout is low productivity. You find yourself working longer and longer hours, but producing little of, of worth, little of value. Then uh, six, sleep and time off no longer refuel you. If you're just tired, you know, a good night's sleep or a good week, week or two off, you know, will help most healthy people to bounce back, to get back on track. If you're burning out, you could have a month off and still not feel any different. Not being refueled when you take time off is a major warning sign that you're burning out. And then number seven, you don't laugh much anymore. Now this is such a small thing, but actually it's a big thing. If you're overstretched, you don't laugh a lot. Nothing seems fun or funny. And at its worst, you can begin to resent people who are enjoying life. You don't laugh much anymore. And number eight, your passion fades. Now, everyone struggles with passion from time to time, but burnout moves you into a place of sustained motivation loss. However hard you try, you can't find that same passion for life or for ministry or for family or for work. Your passion begins to fade. Now, I'm not gonna ask any of, uh, ask those of you who recognize all those signs in your life to put up your hand, but why don't you just, just take a moment to look at those things for yourself. And just ask yourself, are any of those beginning to become a problem? Am I finding myself walking down that path of any of these? Being sucked under by any of these? Anything here in this list I need to address? Or maybe if you're in a good place, which is great, to put it in your pocket and keep it there as a little warning, just how things can very easily unravel. Um, certainly for me, my one experience of burnout was about 20 years ago. Um, and it was from a number of different, different things that happened. Uh, but two of the things that were very, very clear to me uh, that, uh, that, that allowed it to happen was one, my self-sufficiency and one, my, and the second, my isolation. My self-sufficiency, I thought I could do things by myself and I just took on more and more, more and more. And I thought I could do it. I thought I could do it. And it's all about this verse, isn't it? God's strength is made perfect in weakness. And we have to learn, all of us, what it is to be weak so that he can help us to be strong in him. That was one thing. And the isolation, I didn't keep close to others. And this is my next point, keeping close to others. Because one of the keys is to have people around us who can spot the signs for us when often we can't, often we fail to see them, who can help us, who can advise us, who can, who can put their arms around us and give us a hug when we're allowed, or can relieve us of some of the pressure maybe. We need other people. We mustn't get isolated. And when I hit burnout, I realized, again, I started to isolate myself from people. And I love people, but I just had thought, I'm, you know, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I've got to do this and I've got to do that. So I stopped going to my women's group and I stopped meeting up with my you know, closest friends. I stopped really sharing with them. And the more pressure that I laid on myself, the more I felt I was on my own. But we're not. And we mustn't 
get isolated. So I've just put here just a number of who questions, I've called them. Who questions? Who mentors you, speaks truth into your life? Who challenges your thinking or your behavior? Who cares enough to rebuke you? Who understands you? Who do you open up to? Who would you turn to when you're in trouble? Who do you have fun with? Who brings perspective when you become dispirited? Who inspires you to seek faithfully after God? Uh, and again, I'd encourage you to take that away and actually put names alongside each of those questions. And I hope that you find a number of names. I would encourage you, if you're married, not to put your husbands to at all, actually, because we're assuming actually he will be a bit of all those things. But, at, but he can't be everything to us. He can't be everything to us. And um, I, I'm encouraging you to not to put Jesus, because I'm assuming to, he's, you know, he's the one who basically does all this for us. Um, but friends, who are your close friends? Who are your close friends? We need to let others in. And again, this may be quite revealing for some of us. We may think to ourselves, actually, I don't feel I have many, or even one or two who I can go to with some of these things. And if that's the case, you know, God doesn't want to, he, we were never meant to live alone. We were never meant to walk this walk alone. So we need, we need to let people in. We need to invest in friendships and don't take our friendships for granted. Don't get isolated. So and then number nine, beware when the joy goes, when life isn't fun anymore. Ask yourself again, little questions. What's happened to my friendships? First one. Or when did I take part in something where I didn't have any responsibility? That's for those of you who are doers. Or what have I stopped doing or stopped giving time to that I used to love doing? I realized in that time of burnout that I stopped doing any exercise. You know, I wasn't playing tennis, which I love. I wasn't walking, which I love. Um, have I stopped being grateful for the small things? That's a big one. Again, am I getting bitter or resentful towards others? Have I allowed comparison or competition to creep in? Big one for us women. Comparison, competition. Those are deathly, deathly for our spirits. Beware when people start to irritate us. <laughs> Beware when we come home from church on a Sunday and all we can think about or talk about is the negative stuff, the stuff we didn't like, the stuff that didn't go so well. Beware when we stop empathizing with people. Because, you know, one of the first signs is of overload is often a lack of empathy. We can develop a sort of hardness of heart when we're overloaded. Probably because we, you know, we don't have the capacity to take on anymore. So we sort of shut down. We can develop a hardness of heart. Um, don't be afraid to use the little word no. <laughs> For some of us, that's a really, really hard word to use. Because remember, you can say no to the bigger yes. It's a little phrase that someone, someone's told me. You can say no to the bigger yes. When we don't learn to say no for the bigger yes, the things that are important to us, the people that are important to us, they're, they're the ones that suffer. Um, remember when our family was quite, quite young, I think the children had all just started, uh, the three of them had all just started uh, school. And we decided, uh, or rather I decided, that instead of cooking them tea at five and then us something at seven or eight, and I just felt like I've been cooking all, all, all evening. Um, we were going to have family supper as often as we could during the week, and particularly on a Friday, um, at six o'clock together. Fine, you could do it. And we were going to you know, make it a really big thing. I was going to you know, make a pudding, and we're going to light candles and have music and share properly. Um, and uh, anyway, I can remember, um, this is going back sort of 30 years, I hate to admit. Um, and uh, so we, uh, we didn't really have mobiles, but we left stupidly left the phone on and uh, one particular supper time I can remember the phone went a number of times and Paul and I were silly enough to answer it went again and our son Max who must have been about five at the time got up and said don't, don't worry I'll answer it I'll answer it and I can remember Paul and I looking across the table and thinking oh good boy such a good boy so helpful went over to the phone picked it up simply went go away put phone down <laughs> and we don't have a clue still to this day who he said go away to <laughs> but they did go away but you know why did we do it why did we do it why did we not say this we've made a priority what are we doing so make priorities and stick to them say no to the bigger yes and again i would encourage you just i don't think we've got time right now no 
um, to just take that little list of questions away and use it for yourself. Then deepening our character, number 10. This is probably going to be one of the biggest challenges for each of us, developing an authentic and integrated character. You see, the world celebrates gifts, whether or not they have the character to sustain them. We've got to reverse that. We must look at character first. And character is foundational to everything. And let's just be clear, character is different from personality. Our personality is something we were born with. Our character grows and develops and it is, is determined by the choices we make in life. Um, I've heard character described in a very simple but telling little phrase, who you are when no one's looking. Who you are when no one's looking. And that phrase begins to get to the root of what character really is, because, of course, character is much more than just the image we present to others. Our true character reveals itself at particular moments. It shows itself when we're under pressure. It shows itself in the privacy of our own home, when there isn't a public audience to play to, when we won't be found out, we think. What do we really like at those times? How do we speak to our husband or our flatmate or our children? How do we talk about other people? Our true character will always show itself in the small things. How we treat people on a day-to-day -day basis. Do we honor those who are less able than ourselves? Are we patient with those who aren't as efficient as us? Are we respectful of those who aren't like us? Um, Again, my son Max and I were in Debenhams. He must have been about mid twenties, something like that. We were picking up um, some. Uh, some no, he couldn't be that old because I wouldn't have been buying clothes, clothes for him. He must have been about twenty, maybe at university. And um, we were in Debenhams picking up some things for him. And we got to the counter, and there was a queue as usual. And um, I was um, I, I was looking at my watch already, so sort of thinking, oh God, it's late. Um, and uh, the woman at the checkout was making a mess of things. I mean, she obviously, you know, sort of didn't quite know how to do the jolly thing. And, you know, and she kept on redoing sort of the tickets and, you know, and oh, the queue was there and I was touching and sort of puffing and puffing. And we finally got to the front and I sort of, again, just put the things down and sort of, you know, oh, again, she made a mess with the sort of adding up. And, you know, so by the time I got out of Devon, I was, I really had it. And Max, I remember, put a hand on my arm and went, mum, stop it. Mum, stop it. How do you know that wasn't her first day at work? How do you know she didn't, you know, have a, a mass of, you know, problems that she was just you going round and round, you know, making her all confused? How do you know? How do you know anything about her life? And there you are, just huffing and puffing at her. I was about this small by that stage. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it was, he was right. That showed my, something about my character, and I didn't like it when he pointed it out. God will use everything to develop our character because it's so important. It's so important. And then lastly, we need to keep growing, don't we? We need to do all we can to keep growing in spiritual maturity, being conscientious and deliberate in the way we're developing our spiritual lives. Uh, Rick Warren said this, while we worry about how fast we grow, God is concerned about how strong we grow. You see, God's view on our life, God views our lives from, from and for eternity. So he's never in a hurry. You know, we want a sermon or an experience or a seminar even that'll instantly sort out our problems, don't we? But real maturity is never the result of a single experience, rarely the result of a single experience, no matter how powerful or moving. Growth is gradual, and that's frustrating for many of us. You know, why does it take us so long to change? Well, there are many different reasons. We find it hard to face the truth about ourselves, don't we? We've all got very good at hiding our failings and excusing our faults. It takes time to develop a humble, teachable attitude. Growth is often painful and scary. You know, change seems what sounds wonderful, but so often we prefer what's comfortable and familiar, even if it hurts us. And people often build their identity around their defects, don't they? They say things like, it's just like that to be, you know, that's just like me to be so, I don't know, forgetful or so scatty. You know, it's just the way I am. We excuse ourselves. And we're slow learners. We often have to relearn a lesson 40 or 50 times to really get it. You know, the history of Israel shows us how quickly we forget the lessons God teaches us. 
and how quickly we revert back to old patterns, old well-worn patterns of behavior. And lastly, we have a lot to unlearn. Most of our problems and bad habits took years to develop, and they're going to need time to, and persistence to unravel. And the Bible calls it, doesn't it, taking off the old self, putting on the new self. Doesn't happen overnight. And it's annoying, isn't it, how bad habits take no time at all, no time at all to learn, but good habits, good ones, need lots and lots of practice. We need to be intentional. So the last exercise I want to leave with you and ask you to take with you and to, uh, and to do whenever, whenever you feel the time is right. But I, I thought this, this, I call it a spiritual MOT. And um, I quite like to try and do it sort of once a year. Please don't do it once a week. It'll be exhausting. Um, just once a year will be fine. You know, thinking through these kinds of questions on this last page, it just will help us. It will help us to keep growing and it will help us to keep focusing on Jesus. And they'll help us to keep developing and pushing through to maturity, learning more about ourselves, learning about him who's called us. And I want to finish with that wonderful verse from Philippians. I'm not saying, actually, it's from the message version, so you may not recognize it so well. I'm not saying that I have this all together, that I've made it, but I am well on my way, reaching out for Christ, who has so wonderfully reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this, but I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning me onward to Jesus. I'm off and running and I'm not turning back. And let's make that our prayer, shall we? Let me pray as we end. Lord God, we ask that you would, you would come and you would, you would hold that conversation with each of us over these coming days, weeks, months, how, right into the years of our lives that conversation that continues to show us that you understand us, you know us, you're for us, you're with us. And Lord, we want to learn how to depend on you more so that we can grow up into maturity. And we thank you that you're a God who loves us, who's not like a schoolmaster cracking the whip, but you're a God who sustains us and prompts us, guides us and cares for us. So we invite you, Lord, to come. Come, take what we've heard over this past hour and Lord, we ask that you would have your way with us. Whatever we need to rehear or relearn or wherever we need to be restored, revived. Lord, we look to you in your big name, Lord Jesus. Amen.